So the two topics covered in this video will be how astronomers weigh the stars, how they figure out how massive the stars are, and secondly, how astronomers figure out the sizes of the stars. Is the sun a large star? Is it a, a massive star? Where does it fit into the population of the stars that are observed? So we're going to take a tour here doing uh, a little bit of thinking about gravity. One uh, evidence or implication of having mass is that there's a force of gravity between two masses. It's calculated with Newton's universal law of gravity. The force is equal to a constant times the first mass times the second mass divided by the square of the distance between the centers of the two masses. In my class we're not going to do this calculation but you should be aware that the gravitational force is larger if the masses are larger. It's up in the num masses in the numerator here. If we have more mass we're going to have bigger numbers here and we get a bigger number for the force. If the distance between the stars or any masses becomes smaller then the force becomes larger. We have a division by the square of the distance between the objects. So if that distance is small, that means the force will be large. So keep these in mind as we uh, talk about the, about the stars. We have binary star systems in our galaxy and other galaxies. They are quite common. And from this uh, uh, structure, this system, two stars, they're in orbit around each other, so they have a gravitational effect that leads to motion, leads to a certain size of orbit, a certain speed in the orbit, and this can give us information about the masses of the stars. When we have two stars in orbit around each other, the most massive star it has more inertia, it's more difficult to accelerate with the force that's present, it will have the smallest orbit. So when a star has more mass in a binary star system, it's going to have a smaller orbit. Then the other uh, aspect to this is companion star that is, uh, in a hypothetical example, it has less mass. The star that has less mass is easier to accelerate and easier to pick up a big velocity. It's going to have the largest orbit. Then if we would calculate the ratio of the orbit sizes, each star has its own orbit, if we calculate the ratio of the orbit sizes, we'll find that that's inversely proportional to the ratio of the masses. So if the orbit size, let's say one has an orbit size of 8 units and the other has an orbit size of 2 units, then that orbit size is an indicator that there's a factor of 4 but in the ratio of the masses. The orbit size has a factor of 4. One is 8 units uh, in its dimension. The other is 2 units. The ratio of those is 4. The masses will differ by a factor of 4. So if one is the mass of the sun, the other companion star will be 4 times the mass of the sun. And it's the most massive star that has the smallest orbit. There's almost a uh, connection with this with the playground, with a teeter-totter. If we have an adult and a child on the teeter-totter, the adult needs to sit close to the fulcrum, the balance point of the, uh, the teeter-totter, in order to have a fair teeter-totter, in order to be almost in balance. The child sits on the end, far away from this fulcrum, and the adult sits close to the fulcrum. So the same thing happens with the orbits of binary stars. The most massive star is closer to this kind of balance point in the system, and the least massive star is far away. So astronomers can measure the orbits of stars and also measure the speeds of stars in the orbit. We'll get more to that in just a minute. But that allows astronomers to calculate the masses of the stars. Um, just kind of an example here. Suppose a star is known to have six times the mass of the Sun. We'll say a star is known to have six times the mass of the Sun and its uh, orbit size is 10 units. It doesn't really matter what the unit is, but let's say its orbit size is 10 units. We have another star observed in the system that has an orbit size of 20 units. So the first star is six times the mass of the Sun and it's 10 units uh, for its uh, size of its orbit. The second star has 20 units for the size of its orbit. 
Well, that's larger. That means that star will have less mass. It's a factor of two larger in orbit size. 10 units for the first star. We're saying 20 units for the second star. So there's going to be a factor of two difference in the mass. The larger orbit has less mass. Our first star had six times the mass of the sun. The second star will have three times the mass of the sun, six divided by two. So that's the kind of calculations astronomers do. There's a little bit more to it than that, but uh, that's the way it can be done. Kepler came up with a law for planetary motion. Now for the solar system, the mass of the sun is much bitter, bigger than any planet mass, so we don't really have to include two masses for the solar system. But for, uh, and there's a little bit of units going on here. This is not the full equation, but um, it can be written like this with the proper choice of units. But if we add two masses, the two stars, we'll find that it's equal to the cube of the distance between the stars, one half the distance between the stars, divided by the period squared. Period is the time once around the orbit. If we sum up the masses of the stars, we're going to find that it's equal to the cube of half the distance between the stars divided by the square of the period. So astronomers can measure the sizes of the orbits of the stars. They can measure how long it takes one star to go around the other. So we know these periods and we get the sum of the two masses of the system. And then by analyzing the speed of the stars the astronomers can figure out the ratio of the two masses and solve this equation. My students are not going to do this, but uh, my students should be aware that astronomers do have the tools available to calculate masses of stars. This is crucial. It's uh, very important information about the star to know what its mass is, and the study of binary stars allows for this calculation. We can calculate the masses of the individual stars. This Kepler's third law tells us the mass of the sum and then the study of the motion of the stars, the speed of the stars, allows astronomers to calculate the individual masses. So talking about this, we're talking about a spectroscopic binary system. A spectroscopic binary system. In this system you can't see the separate two stars. What you see are the spectra and you have two sets of absorption lines. These absorption lines will shift back and forth. When one star's absorption lines are going towards the red, its companion star absorption lines will be going towards the blue. The two stars are orbiting around each other and they alternately come towards the Earth and then move away from the Earth. I can't make... Uh, that's a little bit better. The two stars orbit a common center and when one star is coming towards the Earth, the other star is going away from the Earth. One star goes away from the Earth, the other star comes towards the Earth. So we have these absorption lines that shift back and forth by using the Doppler formula. Astronomers can calculate the speed of each star and work out their masses. Um, so very crucial that uh, we have these spectroscopic binary systems something you need to be aware of. There are lots of binary star systems in the sky that don't show any shift of their spectral lines. Why is that? The stars are moving around each other, but the wavelengths don't change as observed from the Earth. Hopefully you're recalling that the Doppler shift uh, does not give us any indication of sideways motion. If we happen to be looking face-on to the orbits of the star system, the stars are going to go up and down, left and right, but not come towards us or away from us. If we're looking at the um, kind of the equator, the orbital plane of the system, then a star come towards us, a star come away from us, and we'll get this Doppler shift. So the spectroscopic binaries, uh, the uh, uh, orbit has to be tilted appropriately to cause this effect. And uh, astronomers can work out things if the orbit's not perfectly uh, uh, tilted and looking in the the orbital plane, but uh, it's easier if it is in the orbital plane. So these stellar masses, uh, the period of the orbits, the size of the orbits, astronomers can calculate the total mass. They measure the velocities using the Doppler shift of the spectral lines. That gives the ability to calculate the individual stellar masses. 
And in this, the star with the smaller mass is has the greatest speed. The star that has more mass sits more in the middle of the orbiting system, doesn't move as much, has a smaller speed. But the smaller mass has the largest velocity. And here's some results. This, these are not perfect uh, numbers, but just kind of uh, some I found in Wikipedia. But a massive star, um, an extremely massive star, 150 times the mass of the sun. And stars are just barely a star, barely having nuclear reactions in the core, 0 0.083 solar masses. So that gives us kind of a range. So the sun is here at one solar mass. And we'll study the populations of stars, of how many really massive stars are there in the galaxy, how many very light stars there are. Uh, but you know, we're, there are stars that are much more massive than the sun. There are stars that are much less massive than the sun. Now, eclipsing binary stars. Now, this will be a spectroscopic binary, but in addition, if the orbit is really edge-on to us, then one star will pass in front of the other star, and the brightness of the system will change. When the two stars are side by side, we get maximum brightness. When this red star blocks some of the light from the yellow star, then we get an eclipse occurring, and there's a change in the brightness of what we see at the Earth. And when the red star goes back behind the yellow star, we also get a change in the brightness of the light. Now, the eclipsing binary stars are systems that, uh, again, can reveal this mass of the star, but we can do more. But wait, there's more. And uh, just a quick question before we get to that. When do we have maximum Doppler shift? Say this red star. When is it going to have its maximum Doppler shift? And you should be saying either the left side or the right side. That's going to be the time when the star in its orbit is moving towards us or away from us. When it's right in front of the yellow star, the red star's velocity is sideways, and uh, so is the yellow star velocity, but we won't see a Doppler shift. But we do see a dimming of the light, an eclipse of the light. So, how about the size of the stars? Well, because these stars are moving, there's a Doppler shift, and astronomers can calculate the speed of the star in its orbit. And how do you calculate distance traveled if you know the speed. What else do you need? You need the time. Distance equals rate multiplied by time. So on this uh, light curve, a graph of the brightness of the star system versus time, as this red star comes around, as it just starts to come in front of the yellow star, that'll be at this point in the curve where the intensity of light is just starting to drop. When we get down to this part of the light curve, the red star is fully inside uh, our view of the disk of the yellow star. The star does not go through the yellow star. The red star is in an orbit around the yellow star. But uh, when the red star gets to be fully in front, from our point of view, of the yellow star, then we get down to this constant light time, and then the red star starts to move out away to the right uh, from our view of the yellow star. And then back here, the red star is moving behind the yellow star, fully behind the yellow star, and then coming out again. So this time of uh, just starting to dim until the dimming is at a constant value, this it gives us indication of the diameter of the red star as it moves across when it just starts to touch the left edge of the yellow star till when it's fully inside. That's a motion of a diameter across the system. So we astronomers can record these time events and we can know the length of time it takes for that star to move across. We know the speed of the star. Distance equals rate times time. A similar thing is done for the yellow star. When the red star just starts to touch here and then when it just starts to exit being in front of the yellow star from our point of view. So when it just starts to touch, when it just starts to exit, and not block the yellow star as much, that length of time multiplied by the speed of the red star gives us information on the diameter of the yellow star. So this first uh, little dip here, that timing gives us information on the diameter of the red star. The information or the time from just starting to dim until starting to brighten again after the eclipse, 
That gives us information on the diameter of the yellow star. Very important. We have uh, measurements of the sizes of stars from this eclipsing binary effect. Um, so just uh, to illustrate this again, I'm showing some of the timings here. And when this star just starts to come in front of the red star and then over to this side, so we would have this drop, and it's actually this drop right here. When the white star just starts to go in front of the red star and then over to here, we can measure that time. Um, we can measure the time, and there are lots of choices for times. Uh, when, we, when the white star is fully uh, in front of the red star until the time it's fully in front over here, um, and if we know the size of the white star, then we can get information on the diameter of the red star. It's not too crucial that you are, uh, you're not, for my class, you're not going to be doing this calculation, but you need to know the principle. Distance equals rate times time. From the Doppler shift, we know the speed of this smaller white star, and by measuring the brightness of the star as a function of time, Astronomers can know the elapsed time for this white star to do its motion, and we can get information on the size of each star. You get the diameter and you get the radius by dividing by two. So that information is known for many stars. <coughs> Just a word about Betelgeuse. Uh, if we look here at the constellation of Orion, um, Betelgeuse is a bright red star. It is called a red giant star. It is a very large star. And uh, we have the other uh, stars in Orion here. And you can see they're kind of bluish. And then there's another red object down here. This is red for a different reason than the Betelgeuse color of red. We'll cover this gas cloud in the sword of Orion. We'll talk about that later in the course. Uh, but Orion is a young region of stars. Uh, in this area in here, there are stars still forming, and uh, the massive stars tend to have a blue color. This red star, it's an old star, it turns out, and uh, we'll talk about why it becomes red. But for Betelgeuse, it turns out it is large enough that the Hubble telescope can take a photograph of it. We can't see sunspots the way we see uh, sunspots on the sun. We can't see star spots, but... Uh, our technology is getting to the point where we're starting to be able to image a star directly. That will be another way that astronomers can calculate the diameters of stars. Uh, if we take a direct image, we can know how far across here the angle is. If we know the distance to the star, those parallax numbers are important. Uh, if we know the distance and we know the angle across here, astronomers can calculate the size of the star and calculate the size of individual stars without requiring the eclipsing binary system. So that's our uh, progress here. We're making progress. Astronomers can determine the masses of the stars. Gravitational effects affect the orbit, affect the speed in the orbit, affect the size of the orbits, and by measuring those quantities, the speed and the size, astronomers can get an idea of the masses of stars. And the eclipsing binary stars, as the stars pass in front of each other, the timing is recorded. The spectroscopic information gives us the speed of the stars. Distance equals rate times time. So astronomers can calculate the sizes of stars. So that's a little progress here in our data. Keep reading and keep asking questions. Uh, we'll see you on the next video.